Hey there, I'm Josh. Welcome back to 16 Stops. This is episode four, and I'm here with Brandon. What up? And today we're going to be talking about creating the perfect camera. <laughs> and I think we all <laughs> definitely want to talk about this. And Brandon, we have talked about this several times offline and oh yeah probably one of the motivating factors to start the podcast was to just talk about why can't all these people just make the perfect camera like we all know we give them so much feedback it's like oh yeah i guess they really don't want to crop in when shooting 4k yeah so we have a lot of thoughts and we we realize that there is no perfect camera because everyone's needs are different and we're going to get into that today we're going to uh, talk about what we would want in our perfect cameras, and it'll be a lively discussion, I'm sure. So first of all, uh, the engagement in the first three episodes has been incredible, so thank you, everybody. Uh, I feel like we've tackled a couple of um, challenging topics, to say the least, and people have definitely been engaging about it, so yeah. So keep keep that up. And also, please email questions, comments, and topic ideas to 16stopspodcast at gmail.com. We would definitely appreciate that. And all right, so let's get on to some personal stuff first. So uh, Brandon, you returned your FX3? I did. It was a bummer, but uh, as I explained in the last video, it's probably the better value move over the long run to start investing into Sony, but I just I can't do it right now. I simply can't take the hit on my RF stuff, and then I don't have the money to reinvest that into all new Sony gear, but I love that camera. Cool. It was interesting to hear your um, experience with it and, you know, obviously offer some guidance to get started. And and uh, I feel like eventually you'll probably wind up with it. But yeah, yeah, it's it's really, really hard to switch. I mean, usually you have to give up stuff and wind up with less gear to like make it balance. So it is it is challenging. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, did some upgrades in the studio, which I'm really excited about. So I upgraded my audio. You got a video coming out on it. I you? did. So actually it would have come out by the time this video goes out. So did I blow something? What's that? No, no, no. I was going to say I have a, had a video that just came out. It's, it's awkward when you're recording a podcast because you're like talking about something that is going to happen, but already happened when people watch it. <laughs> that's true. And, anyways, uh, I have a video that's going to be a full breakdown. It's really interesting because I do a lot in the studio space. And Brandon and I have talked a lot about efficiencies with workflows and uh, YouTube sets and, and all. So it, I go into like all the details. So it's going to be really cool. Or it is really cool. <laughs> um, and Brandon, you I know you just got back from Firefall, but you sent me some footage that looked incredible. So oh, thank you. I know you're putting some stuff together. When and where are we going to be able to see that? That's That's dropping on Monday. So, okay. Yeah. So it probably already dropped. If <laughs> yes, by the time this comes out, you, it will be up and you can watch it. And that's going to be on my camera channel. That won't go on my okay. channel. Uh, All right. Definitely not to cut in, but if you've never been to Firefall, it's in Yosemite National Park. It's kind of like a, meteoro a meteorological phenomenon where basically a waterfall gets hit perfectly by sunlight and it makes it red. If you've never been to Yosemite for Firefall, you definitely got to do it once. And I just hit the thing on my chair, and it lowered me by like a foot. <laughs> <laughs> that was awkward. Somebody's hey, like, you were talking what? about Firefall. Fire. So yes, yeah. let me let me do it again. Firefall. Uh, comedic relief. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm such a dork. All right, all right. Continue. So on. we'll get to some. All right, we'll get to some news and rumors, and then we'll get onto the topic, kind of the standard um, setup for this podcast or format. So first of all, the Sony Creator app just got announced, and I was trying to figure out something. Uh, I was trying to figure out the details, and I think it's kind of vague, but I guess there was a lot of cloud stuff that was available for sort of more high-end professional studio kind of settings, and they're going to implement that not, that now for individuals. I think the details a little vague. There's some like you can like transfer footage to the cloud and uh, maybe some basic video editing and, and stuff like that. I'm not really sure on all the details, but yeah, camera to cloud is getting pretty big. Yeah. So I'm it's kind of unclear about which cameras it'll be you can use it for and stuff like that. But I saw a rumor that the A7 IV is gonna have a firmware update by the end of the month. Do you think so, that's gonna be included in it? So yeah, I think that's really the reason. So the rumor I saw said uh, firmware version 2.0. So I think the big thing is it's going to have support for that. I'm hoping that firmware 2.0 will put the newest menu system. So the one that's in the FX3, the FX30, A7R5 with that quick menu, that main menu. That's thing. not in the A7 IV? No. What A7 IV has the older new menu. <laughs> that's Wow, that's confusing. Yeah, so it's hard for me. Those are my two cameras. So I'm always like, I just want the new, the newest, you know? Uh, I, I think I don't all... want the old, old menu. I want the new, old menu. No, I want the new, new menu. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know what else is going to be in there. I think there's a lot of hopeful things. Um, I have no idea. We'll see. If they, I don't think they could unlock 4K60 crop. If they did that, man, that would just, I, I'm assuming it's a, I think I'm assuming it's a hardware thing. They can't do it. Anyways, we'll see what happens. Uh, we are sending people to Mars and we have cars that drive themselves. How can we still have crop issues? Crop four, crop I don't know. I'm not an engineer, but it's it's stupid. I don't know. Canon can do it in a twenty five hundred dollar camera. Come on, yeah, they can you do know? it in a two th- a fifteen hundred dollar camera now. Oh, that's right, the R the R eight. That's right. Okay, suck it, Sony. So I guess this is part of <laughs> this is part of our discussion today about the perfect camera. All right, so we reported on that new ZV style camera from Sony that it was going to be a fixed lens camera. Now the rumors have changed. It's going to be a full frame E mount camera. What? Um, it sounds like it might be named the ZV E one hundred. I don't think we get any more confusing. But the rumored specs of now are 12 megapixel sensor, 4K 60 and 4K 120 with no crop, no EVF. So essentially like an A7S 3 or an FX3. Yeah, and hopefully under $3,000. This kind of makes sense to me in terms of like what Sony's done in the past by like just reusing stuff, right? And uh, But I don't get this at all. Like I just, it seems weird. I don't know who's going to be like. Then what, what makes it different from the A7S 3 No EVF, so it's cheaper. So isn't that the A7C Mark II? No, the A7C Mark II is supposed to be the A7 IV inside. Oh, okay. Weird. So now we're getting like two <laughs> tiers of full-frame EVF-less cameras? Yeah, and what's even weirder is like we have the FX3, the A7S3, and then if this is true, the ZVE100. Uh, that's really hard to say, ZVE100? ZVE100? I don't know. Um then they're all be the I don't s- they call it the ZV1. That's easy. They already have that camera. Well, okay, you know what? I just praise Sony for their designation. <laughs> I have to take it all back now. All right, all right. So anyways, we'll keep an eye we'll keep an eye on that. I have I I, I really don't know what's going on with that, but all right. we'll see. Let's see it when uh, we see it. Sigma announced some Z mount lenses. So for Nikon, um those I I didn't even realize it didn't exist, but the standard ones that we talked about last week, the 16, 30 and 56 crop sensor lenses for their Z mount system. So good to see Sigma put out more lenses and some other Sigma news. There was an interview that Photo Trend did with the um, with Sigma's manager Tamaki, and he had some really interesting stuff to say about Sigma. I know we've been talking about Sigma a lot lately because they've been, as you said, I think crushing it, crushing, crushing it. <laughs> um, they asked about the four thirds market, and the quote was, "The demand for this format is decreasing very sharply. Also, that the UP- APS-C market is declining too, and most manufacturers are focusing on full frame." So. I think they're starting to see that trend, which we've all been talking about. And, you know, not that micro four thirds are bad cameras, but it's just where, you know, people are making money right now in terms of manufacturers. Yeah. It's the whole like micro four thirds is dead. And Sigma's like, it's not dead. It's kind of, it's like comatose. And now they're like, yeah, we're, yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was some uh, talk in there about the new 50 millimeter lens that it has some new HLA autofocus motor, which I don't, I don't remember what that stands for, but, uh, instead of the stepping motor. So it's kind of uh, a really high-end motor that's been in some of their bigger lenses, and they're going to try to implement it more in some of their future lenses and have uh, instead of the stepping motor. So that's good for video for sure. Tight. Yeah, nice and tight. Uh, So they're also going to be coming out with some more unique lenses, which I think is interesting because it seems like Sigma has a lot of the standard lenses covered, and we see companies like Tamron making the 20 to 40 or the 35 to 150, which is incredible. That two is F2. That the F2 F2 to F2.8. 2. 2. Yeah, so some more unique lenses. And so the quote I saw was today's phot- photographers also like to use bright primes, long range telephoto lenses, or ultra wide angle lenses. These are the types of lenses we want today for today's photographers. So it looks like they're going to come up with some new stuff. What if we confused the term unique instead of like technically unique to just appearance unique? Like one looks like a teapot or something. That'd be weird. Different colors, yeah. maybe like don't just make a black lens. Yeah, here's a neon pink lens that also looks like a cloud and spins up and lights up at night. You're like, God damn it, I didn't want that. Yeah, try to take that on a professional shoot. Like, what do you? Ha- what is that? You it's know? the newest thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the the last thing from Sigma that they're continuing to work on their Fovian sensor, which I don't know a ton about, but it's basically a three layer sensor to absorb red, green, and blue at each pixel. So there's a lot of advantages to that, and I'm it. It's. I think it's still far out for them to be maybe like a year or two, but they're still working on it. And I can't wait to see that if that happens because the only Sigma sensor I'm aware of is the Sigma FP 
right? Yeah. I, you know, and I don't know a ton about the FP. This is where we could use Justin, you know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't know too much about that sensor other than it had supremely good color. This is what I remember from Justin's, uh, Justin's not review, but like the research that he did on that sensor. It, I mean, it was, it's pretty impressive. And the people that use the FP like swear by it. So having a new sensor and like an upgraded FP would be pretty dope. Yeah. Really cool. And I, I, from what you just said, I also have heard that it's one of the most ac color accurate sensors ever made, like rivaling some of the most expensive cameras ever made. So yeah, it'd be cool to see Sigma come out with a new sensor. That'd be really neat. Um, all right, so moving along, Tamron 11 to 20 f2.8 for Fuji X mount. So, like you say, it exists. It exists. <laughs> there's there's rumors about a new Nikon camera coming out in March, either maybe the Z6 Mark III or the Z8. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, I don't. I'm not in the Nikon world at all, but I know that it's interesting to see new cameras coming out for sure. Uh, Black Magic cameras had it. There was a lot of news in the last few days. It's crazy. Oh man, I feel like Black Magic basically pumped everybody up and then threw a massive curveball. <laughs> There's probably some the people that are excited about this. Switch. Yeah, so. yeah, I'm sure I'm sure there are. It's just like in in our niche, the non-broadcast side, everybody's like, is this it? Is this the new cube black magic pocket cinema camera? Oh, the holy grail, the thing that's gonna take out all cube cameras ever made. And they're like, here's a broadcast camera. You're like, God damn it. Yeah, if you don't know, I mean most of us were hoping for a new black magic whatever um, not studio camera. I think we've been waiting for a few years. They've been uh, taking the 6K and just like morphing it constantly into other stuff. Uh, but it, has, it seems it doesn't seem like there's a lot of R&D going on, at least not that we see. So I don't know. Black Magic, you know, they're just... I, I had the 4K and the 6K Pro, and I love those cameras. They were like so much fun. I mean, the ergonomics blue, and the build quality isn't great, but they really are trying to like push the boundaries of what you get in a camera for the for the price you're going to pay. So when they do release this new fabled, you know, cinema camera or whatever, I'm pretty stoked. I'm going to be one of those ones that is seriously watching it. And obviously they're, they're crushing it with DaVinci Resolve. Yeah. Uh, I had a brief time period with the 6K and um, it just wasn't the right camera for me, but I, yeah, it, they're really cool. And I remember when the 6K came out, it was like 6K for, I don't remember what the price was. It was just like mind blowing. Grand, it was like, pretty what? Much 2500 Yeah. It was like, how is this possible? So whatever they do come out with, it's going to be exciting. So hopefully we're waiting for something good. So just to give a quick recap, they're, um, they're production cameras. So they have like a screen on the a big screen on the back. They're made for like actual studio work. Uh, they have the 4K Plus and Pro. Those are like the previous versions that they've been out for a while. So those are the basically the pocket 4K in like a studio um, body. And then they have a G2 or second gen of the 4K. And then they also released a Studio 6K Pro which I don't think they had a 6K version of that studio camera. Yeah, I think I think it is just this one. They kind of remind okay. me. I don't know if you've looked at them. They, this is going to be weird, but what else is new with me? They uh, they look like the guns that Luke Skywalker fires in the Millennium Falcon. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's what it looks like, you know? Don't get all cocky on me, kid. So maybe that's what their, their target audience is, <laughs> the people that grew up with Star Wars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I, now that I see those, that's all I'm going to think. Thanks, Brandon. All right. So there was also uh, a huge like um, television studio mixer thing and then uh, the microphone converter, which is a way to hook up audio to all of their other switcher stuff. So a lot of studio stuff. Not For us uh, filmmaker nerds, not very exciting. <laughs> it's just out of my it's out of my scope of knowledge. That's all. Yeah, that's OK. Uh uh, just trying to move things along, Brandon. Rode came out with a new microphone, uh, the NT1 fifth generation. So that is their classic NT1. But there's some really interesting tech in this, and that's why I want to talk about it, is that it has it's an XLR microphone, and it has USB-C now, which is kind of a common trend. But it does 32-bit float. And also, when you hook it up to your computer, you get to use all of the Rode controls that you get, uh, like in the Rodecaster Pro, with a free app. What? So... So when you hook it up, you have basically the same interface and all of the effect. I don't know about the effects, but all the processing that you get in the Rodecaster Pro, you'll get that in your computer in a free app. That's impressive. So essentially, you can buy that microphone for like 250 bucks. I think that's what it costs. You plug in your computer, you have 32-bit float and all of the processing you get in a Rodecaster Pro 2. That's incredible. That really is incredible. Considering I just bought a Rode Procaster 2, this is, this is news I didn't need to hear from you right now, Josh. 
Uh, you can probably still return it, right, Brandon? <laughs> I'm well within the return window. All right. Well, we'll talk later. All right. So uh, one big juicy topic, which has been out for a while, is the Canon R5 Mark II. And I want to talk about this because we haven't talked about it yet, but also it kind of leads into our discussion. So we'll use this sort of as a segue. So the R5 Mark II uh, started out rumored in, I believe, November. So this rumor has been out for a long time and everyone's kind of assuming that it's happening, but there's been really no update since. Have you heard anything about it besides that? Uh, the only things I've seen is from the ordinary filmmaker. And, uh, so yeah, not much. I haven't either. There was like something out about, came out on Canon Rumors, I think a few days ago that was like, it's coming. We're like, okay, can you give us some more information? You know? Yeah. Really the only things I've seen are kind of like the ludicrous specs that this camera is supposed to have. All right. So let's talk about the ludicrous specs. Um, so again, this was, this came out in November and there's been no updates since, so the first, some of these really remind me of Sony cameras, which makes it sound like this is, a lot of the stuff is not true. So the first one is a 61 megapixel CMOS BSI sensor. So 61 megapixels is a very random number. And to me, it's so not Canon. So it's like, that sounds like the A7R4, A7R5 sensor. Well, doesn't, doesn't the A7R5 have 61 megapixel? Exactly. Why would they do 61 megapixels? You only need like... I think around 40 megapixels to do 8K. So 61 seems like a number that doesn't make sense to me. Oh, okay. Uh, dual digit X processor, sure. 30 frames electronic shutter um, with 12 mechanical. Sounds like the A1. <laughs> um, uh, eight stop IBIS. Again, eight stop IBIS is in the A7R5. I'm, I, I'm just like, I'm reading these and I'm thinking like, these are all Sony specs that I'm reading. Uh, new high resolution mode, similar to pixel shift found on the Sony Fuji. Well, there you go. <laughs> More Sony specs. Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, but doesn't the R6 Mark II do that? Doesn't it have pixel shift? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Is that a photo thing? Yeah, it's basically where you take a photo and then it shifts it over just like one megapixel and takes a photo. So like a 60 megapixel photo would be like 240 megapixels after you're done. Um, all right, so... There's supposed to be a two, four, eight times digital teleconverter, which I don't understand how that's different from like clear image zoom or optical zoom or digital zoom. Like, I don't know what that means, it's but it's probably the same thing. Yeah. You know? like, like the R5 has that like crop mode and I'm sure they're just going to like make it electronic different. Okay. Yeah. Uh, same dual pixel uh, autofocus. Well, too. I guess if it's, <coughs> here's the thing though, Josh, like, sorry to cut you off. No, it's all if good. it does have 61 megapixels, it's ability to kind of like keep cropping in on the sensor and give you like a really high quality output on those little di uh, like digital teleconverters, like be pretty probable. So what you're talking about is not a digital teleconverter. That's, a, that's actually like, it is cropping in on the sensor, a digital. Yeah, that, well, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So this is digital. So I agree. That would be cool. If it had 61 hmm. In crop mode, it would have something like, I don't know, 25 or 30 megapixels, 25 megapixels. Leica does this too with their M11. Okay. So I think it goes from like 60 to like 34 down to like 17 or whatever for so, the three different crop modes. So maybe you could run a Super 16 or something and still get 4K out of it. That would be amazing. That would be really cool. Get like a four, four time zoom and no loss in you know actual resolution. That'd be awesome. So we'll see. Um, same autofocus from the R3 and the R6 Mark II. That totally makes sense. Uh, so more video specs here. We have internal 8K60 recording and 8K raw video specs to be confirmed. This is believable to me because the R5C has 8K60. So I expect to see at least that. So that doesn't seem weird to me. Yeah. Um, 4K 30, 60, 120, all with oversampling. I think that needs to happen because... The R5 already does 4K 120, but it's line skipped in 60 and 120 frames. So that one seems reasonable. Any opinion about that stuff? No, this is all the stuff that like I don't really think about. That's just <laughs> like, you, and and I don't even understand it for the most part. Like it's just, okay. it doesn't, when you're like, oh, it doesn't, you know, it's an IPB instead of all I. I'm like, yeah, I don't care. Okay. All does right. it make well, it onto the computer? Does it look good? <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Sign me up. All right, well. Well, that's why we're a good combo. Uh, yeah. Full HD, uh, 240p video recording, focus breathing correction, new overheating uh, prevention. None of this seems weird to me. Uh, dual CF Express Type B card slot, I think that needs to happen. I think they need to have two of the same card in there. Do you agree with that? That would be rad. Yeah. And the reason for that, if you don't know, is that like if like right now the R5 and the R5C, you have a CF Express Type B and an SD, so you can't do the same recording on both cards. 
because the SD is not fast enough to do some of the higher stuff. So dual recording, standard HDMI port. <laughs> There'll be riots. If really? About time? The oh my gosh! I can't wait till it comes out and has micro <laughs> HDMI, and then, and then it, like it land, it explodes. I'm just gonna have a video of me staring at the camera for like ten minutes, like just why you just staring why? at it, like why? <laughs> like when a dog pees on your floor, you're like, what? Why? Why did you do that? So we'll see. Uh, dual USB C ports. Um, okay. <laughs> Never <laughs> underestimate Canon, Josh. So the next one is interesting, 9.44 million dot EVF. You know what else has a 9.44 million dot EVF? I believe you're going to say a Sony. Yeah, the A7S III, the A7R5, A1. I think those all have that same EVF. Uh, new design of the very angle LCD, so <laughs> A7R5. Anyways, maybe... Maybe all this stuff was like already made and it was completely different. And then the A7R5 came out and they're like, crap. All right, back to the drum, Let, redesign everything. Anyways, so launch time quarter two of uh, 2023. So we're getting there. We'll see. Yeah, we're, we're coming up. When is quarter one in March? It ends March, right? Yeah. So, January, February, March. Yeah. yeah. So uh, 12 you, divided by three. Ah, I so, did it. So, so let's. So what do you think about this camera in general? Do you think that the R5 II is likely to come out this year, first of all? Yeah, I think so. I don't think they would push the delay between the R6 Mark II and the R5 Mark II too far. Okay. Unless they've got some serious juju happening in this camera. I, I think it would be wise for them to release it. I don't know. I don't know, because we got the R5C, you know, maybe that was like, hey, shut up and just take this. I think the That's R5C was a holdover over for a few people or tie over, but the R6 II is so similar to the R5. It's so similar. And I made a video comparing those, so I'll leave that link down below if people want to check that out. But in, in a lot of ways, like, I kind of like the R6 II better than the R5. So Yeah, I could get that. Uh, I, I think that the release of the R6 II kind of forces their hand to come out with the R5 II sooner. That's sort of my thought about it. I, th I think so. I think it... You know, it puts people keenly aware, it puts them on the radar of like, oh man, the Mark IIs are starting to come out now. So, and it and it also <laughs> keeps that uh, the carrot out there for the R1, right? We're still thinking about that R1. I know, like I could only imagine what that thing's gonna have. So it's it's a unicorn, man. It's are we gonna, gonna have see that? full size <laughs> HDMI. If it, <laughs> it's gonna have two. Full, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> one full size and one micro. Yeah. Oh. Stop it with the micro <laughs> HDMI. They're such a joke. They're such a joke. All yeah, right. my wife just broke hers the other day. <sighs> Sorry, she man. She was like, can you fix this? I was like, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like completely like mangled. All right, so any more thoughts on the R5 II? Um, would, would it be a camera you're interested in? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, I loved my R5, and it was probably foolish for me to buy it and try to upgrade to the R5C. The R5C is better. Like, the image quality is better. Like, we both talked about this before when I first started shooting with it. I was like, I don't, how does, how does this make sense? Like it's the same sensor, but the, the image is very different. It's much better, but I miss so much the R5. It was just easy. It was fast. And like, even though the image quality is better on this, it's, I probably shouldn't have upgraded. I probably should have kept the R5 and gone with the speed. So if we can see similar type of image off the R5C on an R5 Mark II, yeah, I'm, I'm super interested in that camera. I would be too. Um, I think it would be a big upgrade for my R6 too um, if I decided to go that route um, for what I use it for. And I, I had a discussion some, with someone recently about the R5 versus the R5C. And I think for most people still, the R5 makes more sense. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Yeah. So the R5C is a pretty weird camera in general. Um, Man, if they could just, if they could somehow figure out how to make an R5C more like an FX3. Okay. So that's part of our, let's. And that's what I'm hoping that R5 Mark II is. Okay. Well, I I don't think it's going to be more like an FX3. I think Canon's still going to stick to their photo, mostly hybrid cameras with like more numbers and all, you know, like we talked about before, they're all kind of the same, but just different price points. I'm, I would like to see like an FX3, a Canon make an FX3 style camera, but this kind of leads into our discussion for today and, you know, building the perfect camera, designing the perfect camera. So I think what we want to do in the rest of the podcast is to have a discussion about like if we were to design the perfect camera, because everyone's perfect camera is different because everyone needs it for different things. Yeah. So 
Some ground rules, first of all. Do we factor in price at all here, Brandon? I mean, that's going to be tough. Like, are we creating things that don't quite exist yet, or are we taking things from previous cameras? I think a little bit of both. I had the same thought. Like, can we just say, like, can we just make stuff up, like, completely random, like, new tech that doesn't exist? Like, I feel like we have to sort of talk within reason in terms of, like, what's available. Yeah, I think there needs to, I think it needs to be grounded in reality, or it's going to get, like, super crazy. And then, obviously, price should matter. Because most of us deal in money and we have limits and we don't have like, you know, the money tree up. But if we had uh, one camera, I guess we could spend a little bit more on it, right? Yeah. So <laughs> maybe like a 10 grand okay. minimum. Okay. Is that is that too much? Am I sounding like an ass I guess right we'll now? see how the discussion goes. Like so t- one thing is Brandon and I have not talked about, like we have some topics, uh, some categories we're going to talk about, but we haven't actually discussed this before this. So this is... Gonna, I'm winging it. I've done zero research Brandon. as per usual. <laughs> but I'm saying we haven't had this actual discussion, like what I want versus yeah, you. We yeah. have. So this is, you're going to hear that. All right. So first off, let's talk about, uh, we're going to get into all the categories, but what are you going to use this camera for? I guess that's the first thing. So if you want to kick it off and then I'll talk about what I would use it for. You know, this is, and this is out of all of the decisions we're probably going to make, this is probably the hardest one for me. But I'm because I love photos and I would say I'm a photographer first and a videographer second. Now, that being said, I run into more issues on the videography side. So I'm going to make it a video camera. Okay. But so no, no stills whatsoever? No, no, no. It's going to have stills. Okay. I'm just but saying, what are you I'm gonna not going to use gonna the camera the... for. I want to hear about your use case. Yeah. You, use case would be like 80% video, 20% photo, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so like YouTube, client work, like what kind of stuff are you shooting with it? That's what I'm curious about. I guess most of the stuff that I'm doing right now, what I'm looking for are just a few things that make my workflow easier. But yeah, it's mostly just content. And if I could, uh, it still needs to be high quality enough that I can do client work and like spec ads. Okay, so I think I'm also in the same boat here where it's a mixture of things, right? Because we're doing a lot of content creation for YouTube and social media, but also doing some client work. So it has to be pretty decent quality in terms of the output and stuff like that. Okay. Just want to like give a baseline here and we're yeah. not like, oh, we're trying to rig this up with multi, you know, camera angles for big shoots and, you know, yeah. like I'm not to- shooting uh, you know, a feature film. I'm not shooting Yeah, so I'm not I'm not like Netflix, although there are some cheaper cameras that are Netflix approved. You know what? I'm just going to shut up now. Josh, drive. Take the wheel. <laughs> All right, let's start with categories. Um, first one is uh, body design, form factor, and ergonomics. Am I going? E- I, either way, I don't care. I'm definitely <laughs> sticking to a box Komodo-esque type of form factor because it's so okay. far out of everything I've ever used, it's my favorite. Okay. I think for me, I would probably pick something, probably something that doesn't exist, but probably closer to something like an FX3. Okay. So... Um, in terms of body design, of course, I'm not the biggest fan of Sony ergonomics. So I just think something small, I would say no EVF. Um, and so let me back up for a second because you're not doing any photos, huh? I don't really do any photos. And for me, um, I, it was hard for me to decide on what I'd use the camera for because there is like, this would be for like 80 to 90% of what I do now. I can't, you can't have one camera that does everything like this really, really hard. So for me, the one point I need an EVF for is when I'm doing wildlife stuff. But that is like such a small portion of what I do. So I'm just going to leave that out of the discussion for gotcha. me. Gotcha. Okay. So I think probably something a little bit smaller than the box camera. Okay. I think the box camera makes it a little bit more challenging in other ways for me personally. So something more like an FX3, but just better ergonomics. Like it's just got to feel better when you hold it. Just like a mini R5. Like you take an R5 and you shrink it down by like 20%. An R3 you mean? Well, I mean, R3 oh, okay. is a great. I'm just saying because the R5 is similar to the FX3, but it's bigger. So you could shrink it down. Because the yeah, R5 I Ergos think... are fantastic. They're not like they R3, are. but. Yeah. So something pretty small. I think for me, I think it, what I'm going to ask for, and you'll hear all my things that I want to put in this camera, it's not going to be as small as an FX3. Yeah. So maybe like a very small box camera, but I'd like to have a grip on it. I don't want to have to add handles and stuff, if that makes okay. sense. See, and for me, are we, are we there yet? Are we still, yeah. are handles yeah, part yeah. of the ergos? 
I, well, if you've got a box camera, you're going to add stuff onto it, right? Yeah. So what I want from my box camera, like on the Komodo, on the very tip top, there are like pins that can essentially be used to operate run stop. I would love those pins on the sides that would okay, operate that different sense. things. So I want handles that connect directly to it, that can rotate, that do run stop, but that can also pull focus. That would be sick. So if okay, you so had like those a pins, 4D? yeah, if you had those pins that could, you know, transfer power and communicate and give you like better ergos, sign me up. That would be so dope. All right, so you like the, the Roden 4D sort of like modular mm -hmm. situation? But no wires, okay. right? Like I don't want... Yeah, no wires. I've got like yeah, the yeah. tilt -a handles and there's wires coming out and they're like, yeah, we made yeah. you a three foot wire. Like why? But why? Why does it need to be three feet? And they're like, well, we don't know how to fix it. So yeah, yeah no wires. Okay, I agree with that. I think some modularity would be cool uh, to add on things like you're talking about mm -hmm. um, and no wires. Yeah, I, I can't stand the wires. I agree with that completely. What? All right, and that's one thing that I love about the C70 is that it is a weird body design, but everything's in the camera. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everything's in the camera. So, all right, some modularity. That's cool. Uh, do you need an EVF? What do you think? So I'm not going to go an EVF. This is what I want. I want, I've thought about this before, way before we ever did this podcast. I want the screen from like the Blackmagic 6K Pro to sit on top of the camera, kind of like where the Komodo screen is, but you can flip it up and rotate it if you want. So instead of it coming out to the side, it would flip up and then you could rotate it around and then it would flip down and have like, you know, the protective case on the back. That is what I want. Okay. I don't want to use like an external well? monitor. I just want it like built in and hinged into the computer. Something that can like rotate up. It very flush to the camera. You rotate it up. You can spin it around if you need to. Like if I had to sit behind the camera like this. So you could like pull it up, pull it up, and then rotate it forward or backward. Yeah. Sort of thing. Or, that would or work. spin it around if you need to. Okay. But at the is, end of the day, you could the sit physics it work? flush. <laughs> did the physics work? I'm just kidding. Well, yeah. I mean, like if you, if it rotated up and then the hinge was in the middle and it twisted, then you could just twist the screen okay. around. Okay. Okay. So that comes down to my next thing was with the LCD size and type, which you sort of already talked about. I want a bigger screen. I'm sick of these like three, 3.2 inch screen. Like give me the black magic screen, yeah. you know? Give me like a five inch screen on the back. I mean, if you're going to leave off the EVF, give me a big screen. If you've never used the 6K Pro screen, not the 6Ks, the 6K Pros, because it was much brighter. And it tilted. And it tilted. Dude. Like, how has somebody not just like picked up a black magic camera and gone, hey guys, we should probably do this. Like this rocks. Can we can we do this? No. So like, why does the FX3 with no EVF have the smallest screen? Like, I don't know, and it sucks. The outside. It, sucks it sucks so bad. So I want a big screen that you can see outside. Yeah. That's you know. That seems um, like a reasonable request, Josh. <laughs> But again, the ergos on the Blackmagic 6K suck too, so. Yeah. So I, right. I want my screen to be as big as like the body. It's a four inch by four yes. inch cube. Okay. I think that's that's fine for me because I honestly operate the Komodo without a screen like 90% of the time. So as long as it's bright and it's like, it's good. Like if you can see peaking, like that's one thing with that FX3, man, it's like almost impossible to tell what's in focus. Yeah, the peaking so it, bad. But on the Komodo, it's got so much like detail to it. Like it's it's actually pretty easy, even with like a two and a half inch screen. So just make it bigger, make it spinny. Cold. And make the resolution and brightness better. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so it sounds like you're already like just taking the Komodo and tweaking it. I'm I'm just getting the vibe that that's uh -huh. yeah. Okay. All right. All right. We'll we'll keep on that 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 thing here. All right, dynamic range. Uh, of course, we 16 want at least 16 stops. Stop. 16 stops. Okay, moving on. Sensor type. Um what do you think about this? We have a couple of different options. Um, you know, obviously, I think we'd probably want a global shutter if we could choose. Oh, my gosh. It's so great. I love it. Okay. Global shutter, uh, hands down, is awesome. Um, but at least a stacked sensor. Like, at least a stacked sensor so we can l get rid of the rolling shutter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about video resolution, Brandon? I, what do you think? For me, I really think 6K is kind of like the sweet spot. 
That's what I was gonna say. <laughs> There's yeah. It's I don't I don't know if this is just Red's six K, but like the Komodo's image isn't like overly sharp, but it's not so soft, you know. There's it, like you, there's just like a texture and a thickness to it that I just love. So, pretty much, if I could just take the Komodo sensor and strap it in that bad boy, I'd be a happy man. Yeah. So with some some more upgrades to the sensor, I think the sensor could be better in some ways, like you were saying with high ISO and frame rate stuff, which we'll get to. But yeah, I agree. Six K two, and that's exactly what I was going to say. And from having used the Komodo a little bit, but also using cameras like the R3 and the R6 Mark II, which have 6K sensors, I really like the fact that you can do an oversampled 6K to 4K, which gives you a little bit extra detail, controls the noise a little bit better, but you still get a 4K compressed image for those quicker workflows, smaller file sizes. <clears throat> but like the 6K RAW that's in the um, R3 is beautiful. So like 6K and also obviously the Komodo 6K raw is just unreal. So I think that's a sweet spot. I think 8K is too much. Yeah, I don't know if this is possible, but if we could make a full frame Komodo sensor, I would put basically the same size that's in the Raptor, the Vista Vision, but make it a, a global shutter. I, I, and that would be so sick. I like I just forgot to mention, yeah, full frame. I think we'd both agree we'd like full frame. Yeah, if I could. Or medium format. God, let's, okay. let's do it. Okay, we're trying to keep this Just under 10 grand though, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm done. All right, all right. But yeah, full frame 6K sensor. I feel like I'm I'm on a agreement with that. And uh, I would like to see a raw option and an oversampled compressed option. Like a ProRes? Like it shoots ProRes too? No, it shoots like, you know, all I or IPB with an oversample. Oh, you know gotcha. what I mean? Like we're, we're all, most of us are using daily. So uh, what about uh megapixels for stills so if we're talking a 6k sensor you know you're probably going to get like 24 megapixels or something like that would that be enough yeah. for you and that's yes okay um in this particular camera yes okay so what a lot of people don't realize is that when you see the megapixels for stills that's using the whole sensor that's the three by two full sensor and then the crop down not the komodo obviously because that's the straight up video camera but the hybrid cameras so that megapixel number, they crop off the top and the bottom, and then they use that for the video. So it's a little bit confusing when you look at these numbers, but I'm just wondering if 24-ish megapixels would be fine for you, but you said yes. Yeah. Hey, that actually brings up like a good point. It would be sick if, yes, it's the Komodo sensor, but is there any way we can make it a little bit taller? That would be great. Yeah, I think There's we need like a three by open two. gate options. Yeah, that's on my list of things to talk about here. So three by <clears> two, I think <throat> would be good for photos, but also for open gate. I think having the flexibility to shoot in all different res like um, ratios would be great. So UHD, DCI, open gate. Especially if you're shooting, you know, like content. If you got to shoot content, it's just so nice if I can like shoot it horizontally. But then because it's taller, I can kind of come in for the vertical stuff and not have to zoom in hella far. Yeah, I, open gate's really cool. <laughs> I don't know why, yeah. I, I guess things have to be faster because you're pulling more data per frame for video. So yeah. things have to be bumped up for that, but there's already com camera companies that are doing it. So I'd like to see more of that. I, I'd love to be able to re read out the full sensor. I mean, this is our wish list. Yep. We can do whatever the hell we want. So other than megapixels for stills, any other recom uh do you need like higher frame rates, anything like that for, for photography? No, I would like two separate menus, kind of like in the R5C. If I could get a photo menu for the workflow side and then, you know, my cinema menu for the cinema side, that would be that would be dope. I would like that. Yes, that would be cool. That's one thing I've talked about over and over again about the R5C is I love how it has the cinema operating system. So what about menus in general? My thought was I want the black magic menus. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, they're so easy. It's so good. Yeah, you're just like, oh, I want this. I want this. I want this. Yeah. Okay. Just a big old touch screen. You're just like, tap, tap, tap. Yeah. yeah. But it would be good to have a separate photo video uh, thing because I know for me it's frustrating. I'm sure for you too. Like we're using these hybrid cameras and they're 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 photo cameras and so the video stuff is like kind of the same but not different enough to really be a video camera. Yeah, the R5C is pretty pretty special in that sense. And I hope that that is a trend that goes forward. Like I would love to see the FX3 have that option as well. 
You know what I mean? The FX3 Mark II, man. Maybe it'll have it. <laughs> Maybe somebody at Sony will watch that. I'm, and they'll be like, Kore wa sugoi desu ne. <laughs> so, yeah, I have thoughts about the uh, FX3 Mark II if that ever does come out. So, okay. All right. Uh, let's see what else we have. In the I'm holding out for a hero. <laughs> uh, codex and stuff. I know we already talked about that. Um, you'd probably like our true raw codex, like an R3D type codex, right? R3D, man. Okay. And if you haven't used that before, um, a lot of the raw codecs that you see in the other cameras aren't really raw. Like you can't go in and change the ISO or the white balance after the fact, like you can in the raw than the red cameras. So real raw. R three D is just the best. B raw is awesome. This isn't a knock on other raws. Well, Josh isn't being like all the others are ass. They're pretty good. Well, the Canon raw but is not R3D the same as R three D or B raw. No, it's. It's not. And the Canon RAW, if you're using Final Cut Pro at least, isn't that great. Like, it doesn't do anything for you. You can't change any of the parameters. But B RAW's probably, I would say, the next best. But yeah. R3D so far is the best RAW codec, I think. I don't Okay, now this is me not using RE RAW. I've never, I've never used, used RE, RE either, yeah, obviously. All right, so what about um, battery life? What kind of battery setup combination would you like to see? I want Tesla to make me a goddamn battery. <laughs> all right. I'd like to get two hours on a battery. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Okay. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's be realistic here. I'd like to get two hours. I want, I want like Honda to make me a generator. No. Yeah. I think uh, two hours would be right. Okay. Uh, like a strap on battery, like on the Komodo or something that goes inside the camera? Or do you care? You said strap on. I did. Um, <laughs> no, I would love something that goes into the camera, kind of like the C70. Okay. Or because it's, you know, I'm I, like, I'm one of those people that I, I get really obsessive about things that don't line up, especially like lines. If you see me sit down for dinner, I'm the guy that moves the fork and the knife and makes it everything like straight. And you're like, that guy's a serial killer. That's why I want like an internal battery because it once it comes outside, it's just like, ah, yeah, it drives I, me I nuts. hear you. I also love the like R3 battery that slides in. It's like part of the camera. Yeah. But I do like the C70 or the FX6 battery because you can get the ones that have the, like the, the D-tap out or the USB out, like the SWX batteries because you can add stuff easily if you want to add a bigger battery and stuff. That's kind of a cool setup. Here's, here's, I know this is a sidebar, but it does, it still applies. We talked about this the other day. Why on earth has nobody figured out how to make an actual battery grip that kicks ass? Why is it that you're like, oh, you can put one more battery in there? Why don't they just make the whole thing like a USB PD power bank that gives you like six hours of runtime? Why is it that I the only thing I can do is I've got like 80% wasted space and then I put another crappy battery in there? Like, figure it out. I agree, Brandon. When you told me that, I was like, I never understood why the battery grips are just like, oh, you could put your normal batteries in. Like, just fill the whole thing with a battery. Yeah. Why can't they just make, make it one giant that battery? Would be such a big battery that would last like all day. Why do we have to like charge all these batteries and then put them in? That's ridiculous. If you're going to charge me almost $400 for a battery, give me grip, the battery. Like, it, <laughs> make it one solid battery. It seems like an old school system. That's like. <clears throat> I don't know. It was probably like, oh, we already have like 80 batteries for this camera. We'll just give you the battery grip because then you can just use the batteries you already have. But yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I will say that Blackmagic and Fuji, like they've figured out to where you can leave one in the camera and then you put the two in there. So that's a little bit better. But no, like at this point, I, I want like an actual power bank, like six hour battery grip. If my camera requires a battery grip and I have to make it that much bigger, it better just deliver so much power and it would have so much more if you just filled that whole thing with a battery like it would have okay we're yeah. putting this out in the universe someone make it please that would be great <laughs> yeah I, I get there's probably limitations with overheating and blah 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 no just shut up and make and it figure it out and we'll deal with the consequences later all right let's talk about the ibis versus internal nds because as of right now you can't get a camera that has both that's also stupid i agree I, I guess there's some technical reason, but for right now, it doesn't exist. So I would wish that both existed, but if you had to pick one, what would you pick? Oh, this is tough, but because it's a... I mean, Ibis is nice, but I I personally, on the Komodo, I haven't cared that much. Like when you stabilize that footage, it, it actually looks really good, uh, just like warp stabilizer or whatever. 
So I would say internal ND because that's maybe the most frustrating thing on the Komodo that it doesn't have is internal ND. Yeah. So I would I would take internal ND. I would take internal but ND as well. <laughs> it's got to it's got to be like the very electronic the Sony ND. One. Like on the FX6. Yes, yeah, I was going to say, I don't rad. want the hard stop one in the Canons. I want that Sony ND filter. It's also electronic. There's a very little color shift. Um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, it, you can variable vary it from two to seven stops, I believe, like with a dial. So that you can, mm -hmm. as you're recording, you can adjust it smoothly like you're adjusting your iris or whatever. And you don't see it like the thing like switch in front of the camera. So, yeah, I would definitely take that. And if it had a decent electronic stabe in the body, plus maybe, you know, if you needed one, you could use lens stabe. But for me personally, like, I don't really care about IBIS so much. Um, it's nice in very certain situations, but I'll put it on mm -hmm. a gimbal if I need a gimbal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Uh, audio. So, you know, one of the big criticisms of, like, let's say the FX6 is that when you take off the handle, there is no audio. So what sort of audio solution would you like to see? Like what's on the body? Would you mind an extra add-on unit? Like what would work for you? That's a, that's a good call. I, I would take either, you know, right now on the Komodo, you get a three and a half. And most of the stuff I'm shooting with the Komodo isn't like, uh, you know, a documentary, a roll where I need like superior audio. So that hasn't bothered me so far. But man, would it be awesome if we got like the preamp set of the C70 and like some mini XLRs. So if I got to keep the oh, size okay, down, okay. I, I would take it. I would take it. If not, maybe there would be a nice flush, elegant XLR system, like a two input XLR that I could just like to the bottom of it with front facing XLRs, not in the back. In the back, you're like always whacking them. They're always getting in the way. So I want them to come out of the front. Okay. So I would like to have one three and a half and one XLR on the body because just to have the option between the two. And yeah, I'd take mini if it yeah, meant keeping nice. the camera smaller. That's fine. I would like to have some sort of module that went on that has like two more XLR inputs or something. But I think, you know, like having the option to just grab the camera and plug an XLR microphone into it just is so helpful in so many situations. Josh, how about this? I'm going back to my pins idea. Like right now with some of the Canons and the Sonys, you get those smart, you know, cold shoes where they have like the wireless mic yep. that can plug yep. in there. Yep. I, I want that. I want that. I want a mic that just like slides into the smart adapter and I'm done. No wires. I hate wires. Sony makes no that. Wires. Yeah, but they're tall and they're ugly. Like I just want something that's like, let's put the thing in the mic. If I got to make the mic longer, make it longer. But I don't want it to be tall and, and bulky. I'm trying to keep this thing really compact. This is this is my wish list. Yeah, maybe that right slides on one of your camera. pins that you were talking about, right? Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay. Like, let's make these pins a little more functional. Okay, I like that. And you just slide the mic on. You don't got any wires. Okay. Yeah. At least a 3.5. I would love an XLR mm -hmm. on the camera somewhere. And then I wouldn't mind, like, if it's a top handle it put, pops on or a module that slides on the back or something to get more XLR inputs. I think that would be fine for me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, autofocus? It would be, I mean, it would be, it would be nice wish list, to have Wish list, wish list here, Brandon. You can, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, wish list. Yeah, I would totally take Sony's autofocus. Here's the thing. I would take Sony's autofocus. I'm going to make a compromise and I can hear my dog trying to get me in the studio. <laughs> uh, Henry, go away. You sound like a, I'm like the dude from The Shining right now. Um, if I could have Sony's autofocus in photo, and as a compromise, I would take no autofocus in video. You don't have to compromise. We're talking about the perfect camera here, Brandon. Okay, well, then I want Sony's autofocus in everything. Just give it to me. Give me Sony's autofocus. I agree. I, I've used all the systems now, and Sony definitely has the stickiest autofocus. It just kind of knows... I just know, Other than wildlife videography, for whatever reason... The Canon system, it's not that good. the Canon system is better. I, I mm -hmm. that's the only thing. But again, this is my ninety percent use camera, so I'll take Sony's autofocus. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about uh, lens mount. If you had to pick a lens mount that exists already, what would you put on the camera? Man, that's it's tough because like the Sony E mount, their their ecosystem is massive. We've talked about this so many times, you know. Uh, really hard I man know. i would i would have to yeah i would have to say that but 
Oh man, I don't know. I don't know. I I almost want to, I know like people are gonna flip their lids. I almost want to say EF. Well, if you have RF, but, you can adapt it, right? Yeah, but then RF is like, oh, it gets stuck. But you can have RF to PL. I don't know. I can't answer this one at this time, Josh. I'm sorry. Okay, I would. I'm gonna. I'll have to answer. I would take E just because. There's so many other options out there. I'm mostly video focused. I love the RF lenses, but for video, the e, e mount lenses are just smoother in terms of the way they focus, and there's more options, and they're smaller, and all that stuff. So, okay, I will go with that. Then, okay, too. You've convinced okay. me. You sold me. <laughs> but I again, it's like what comes out from Canon the next couple of years. There's a big question mark there. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, and E, yeah. you can adapt. It's, it's funny because I also. No, go you ahead. You can adapt lenses. Like you can put EF lenses on E mount. You can, you know, mm -hmm. you can do a lot of adapting as well. Can you adapt I, PL to I, E? You should be able to, right? I don't know. You're asking the wrong person. Sorry, Sorry Josh. <laughs> you need a smarter co host, is what you need. I'm supposed to know that answer. <laughs> is anybody out there yeah. uh, that wants this job? You do have to edit all the videos. <laughs> Brandon, you can't give it up yet, but man. If, <laughs> I know we're only four episodes. All in. right, uh, HDMI, SDI, of course, at least a full size HDMI. Yeah. Do you care about? Is H there something smaller than micro HDMI? <laughs> Do you care about SDI? No, because my monitor is going to be wireless. Remember those pins? It's going to go right in there. Okay. Okay, but it should have. I I would agree. I don't necessarily need SDI for my workflow, so for me, HDMI would be fine. I. You know, with the Komodo, I have SDI, and I love how secure it is and how strong it is, but it is more finicky. It's, like, more meticulous. I feel like I have to be much more careful around it, whereas, like, full-size HDMI, is, it, it's not that it's more robust or it's, like, better. It's certainly not better, but it just feels easier to navigate. But I'm going to go wireless because I have super smart pins, Trademark. Okay. <laughs> well, it technically would be wired just without, like, it would plug in. It's not like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or whatever, right? It would be connecting, like, through that pin, right? Yeah. So here's the thing, though. Those pins on the Komodo are flush. Remember that? There's, like, not oh, actual right, right, pins right. that you would break off. Right. That's what's so ingenious about it, Josh. Okay. But right now, like, if you hook up a monitor, you can do that with Wi-Fi, right, on, on the Komodo. So... But what I'm talking about is yeah, but like you I, got latency, right? And stuff. That's what I'm saying. It's got to connect through those electronic pins. Yes, okay. but those pins are flush. They're not right. like the traditional pin okay. that you would like. Snap. I was thinking wireless, as in like Bluetooth or or Wi-Fi or something like that. Gotcha. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, what about memory cards? What do you want to see in the camera? Wow. Let's see a floppy floppy, floppy disk? disk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, the, the CF Express Type Bs would be rad. If we could get two of those, plop those in yep. there. Yep, I agree. That's that's kind of the best card, I, I feel like, right now, um, in terms of like what you can get for the price. They're super fast and durable. I would, I would take CF Express Type B as well. Um, yeah. We talked about the menu system already. Uh, what about monitoring tools? Um, I know you talked about the actual monitor, but like, what kind of monitoring yeah, tools you. would you want to see in the operating system? False color, histogram, waveform. And then uh, geoscope. Okay, is that the goalpost? No, the the Komodo monitoring is awesome. So that is the goalpost. Like you have. Why did my computer just turn on? That was so weird. Sorry. So they've got like red, green, and blue channel for both your highlights and your shadows, and it's, so it's super easy to tell whether or not you're clipping one of those. And I and I love that. It makes exposing very fast. But geoscope is just like you can assign different stops, like a, a number value. So when you turn that on, you can see like exactly, is it stops or is it IRE range? I can't remember, but it's really easy to go, where are my highlights exactly? And you can assign a color to it. Where's my middle gray? Assign that a color. So it's like really cool how you can dial that in. Okay. So any other features? I agree with you. Of course, false color waveform. Um, and we didn't mention this before, but shutter angles, like a no brainer. Can we please get that in there? <laughs> um, what other features or anything else that we leave off that sort of you'd really like to see in your perfect camera? <sighs> I'm trying to think if there's anything out there. You know what? I would really like the Ronin 4Ds like focus pulling map. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How that LiDAR of, thing. 
instead of like focus, yeah, yeah, I think LiDAR is pretty badass. And then instead of it's just like focus peaking, you actually get like a 3D map. And so you can see like the front of somebody com and, and it's like really quick to like hit that mark. I think that would be pretty bad. Okay, so instead of just focus peaking, you have that crazy LiDAR system. Have you ever used that? I haven't gotten to play, to play with that. I, ha I have not. They have it at my camera store. I don't think they like me though. I don't think they would let me play with it. Yeah, let them know you're a podcast host. Maybe, uh, you know, I'm just kidding. I don't think that's going to go over well. Okay, so it sounds like you want a more user-friendly Komodo. Yes. Okay. With Jared, more mod yes. <laughs> with more modularity and some autofocus and, and some of that stuff. For me, like I think I'm kind of taking a little bit from the FX3, a little bit from the Komodo, a little bit from Canon. I'm trying to like piece together this Frankenstein camera. Yeah, it, it's definitely like, hey, what's your favorite camera? All right, let's make it a little bit better. And then you're okay. like, dude, I'd be happy with that. Okay. I'm I'm sure they're like it's what I want to know is what the people watching, what their like ultimate camera would be. So if they want to like build it down in the comments, that would be cool. They're like, oh, I want the GFX 100S or I want a red helium, but I want it to do this. Yeah. And I would definitely like to see some more video features on the medium format cameras because as of right now, maybe the technology is not fast enough. I'm yeah. really sure. What I'd if you had a medium format camera like the GFX 100S, but it was like a stacked sensor? Like a BSI stack sensor. That way, it takes care of like the speed. autofocus speed and all that. Yeah, I mean, Ooh, I mean how, how expensive would that good be? Golly. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If Fuji did it, it'd probably be like ten grand. How bad yeah. do you think those people feel that bought the GFX one hundred and then like one year later they're like, you can have a better camera for half the cost almost? I feel like if you have a camera like that, you're shooting for like IMAX theaters or something, right? Like, I don't know. I mean, why not? All right, all right. Well, it sounds like. Uh, we're pretty close like all the stuff's out there and Brandon and I are like theorizing about what would make us a perfect camera but uh, there are more cameras uh, rumored to come out this year so we're excited to see all those and maybe we can dive into some of the brands specifically and what they could improve or what they're doing well in future episodes if you're interested in hearing those sort of breakdowns let us know in the comments below uh, I'll be happy to talk about each brand in particular or whatever so all right Brandon any other, any other thoughts to wrap us up here Please stay involved. We love the comments. Continue to comment. If you can, though, I would love to see some of your faces via a video question or suggestion. So make sure you send those to 16stopspodcast at gmail.com. Absolutely. Videos are great. We're making video. We'd love to include you in our video. So Yeah, somebody's got to be first. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to send this to my mom and be like, hey, mom, can you help me out? I would love to have one of you guys do it. But, uh, yeah. Thanks All for right. the support, everybody. Yeah, the support's been awesome. We've been having a blast, and I don't think we have any um, inkling of slowing down at, this, at the time being, so we're having a blast doing this. So we'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much. Peace. Nice work, Josh. <laughs>